A chill trembled down my spine, piercing into my soul, as I started this recounting. A dire memorandum, my last testament before I let the curtain fall on my own life. I wanted to etch my tale, not on the forgiving canvas of paper, but on the immutable slab of digital audio. My intention wasn't a desperate cry for help, but rather an explanation, a lesson on the malevolence death brings, and the cataclysm it can unleash when you let a life slip through your fingers. It was on a bright afternoon, around 2 p.m., when my little angel, barely old enough to understand the world, returned from the kindergarten. A ray of sunshine in my drab existence, she was my sweet respite. The children at her school had an early release, allowing me to eke out an hour or two of solitude to immerse myself in the mindless oblivion of television flicks. I turned off the television at precisely 1.40 p.m., its spellbinding allure subsiding. The exact moment the TV died, the doorbell chimed. An enthusiastic little scout and her patient mother stood at my doorstep, armed with boxes of sugary delights. I happily traded dollars for these small rounds of joy, the tagalongs, their scent wafting sweetly in the torrid Florida air. A small tip for the young salesgirl was the least I could do, a nod of appreciation for her efforts in this searing heat. About twenty minutes into my cookie binge, the front door swung open with a familiar cheer. Hello, Daddy. Her energy warmed my heart, and the simplicity of our routine life lulled me into a deceptive peace. Everything was ordinary, blissfully mundane, until that fateful night at 1.40 a.m. My slumber was shattered by my daughter's piercing scream, slicing the silence of the night like a dagger. I stumbled out of bed and sprinted to her room. My heart hammered in my chest as I witnessed her huddled figure, crouching in the corner of her bed, her body racked with terror. I swept her up in my arms, flicking on the room's light. My breath hitched as I read the crimson words that desecrated her wall. Lust, gluttony, greed, sloth, wrath, envy, and pride. Sins of your forefathers, sins you can't hide. A cold chill ran down my spine. What was this cryptic message, these seven deadly sins? My daughter's shallow, rapid breaths were her only response, her repeated murmurs of daddy, 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 echoing the horror of our predicament. Her asthma inhaler was within my desperate grasp, but her fear-induced attack was beyond its scope. Without a moment's hesitation, I hoisted her into the back seat of my car and raced through the desolate streets to the closest hospital. We were promptly attended, and the physicians managed to steer her away from the brink of a cardiac arrest. My darling angel, just five years old, was diagnosed with heart disease. Fast forward seven years, during which the mystery of those sins came back to haunt us. It was Christmas time. I had Samantha, my rock and wife, and two beautiful children. Haley, now a lively twelve-year-old, and Gregory, our four-year-old son. Life seemed perfect, a picture of happiness, if not for the events that started to unfold. The first year was marked by an inexplicable shift in the women around me, their unwanted attention and constant flirtations becoming an unnerving fixture in my life. But the real horror was in their suicides, brutal and grisly, when their advances were spurned. One woman, a jovial spirit I once knew, gutted herself with a kitchen knife. Another, a kind neighbor, was found hanging from her house's gutter. The second year brought another blow. Haley's heart condition worsened as she developed an obsession with food. She was in and out of the hospital over a dozen times before swinging to the other extreme, starving herself until she was skeletal. The third year, financial devastation arrived. My house was foreclosed, and I became obsessively miserly with my money and resources. Samantha, a beacon in this storm, allowed us to move into her home. By the year's end, we were married, and the following October, we welcomed Gregory. The fourth year brought a new form of menace. Talent agencies relentlessly pursued me for my singing talents, talents I had casually exhibited in a local band. The harassment turned violent, with one frustrated scout attempting to murder me outside my own home, leaving me with a bullet-clipped ear. In the fifth year, rage consumed me, turning me into a monster who lashed out at my loved ones. In a cruel twist of fate, I tumbled down the stairs in the same month, damaging my brain and leaving me with fragmented memories of my violent past. In the sixth year of our torment, Haley, blooming into a young woman, was stricken with jealousy. Gregory, being the baby of the family, garnered much attention, and this created an ugly rift. 
No amount of assurances about infants needing more care could quell her anger. Her resentment exploded into bouts of violence, ending with her running away from home. We reached out to the Center for Missing and Exploited Children, who located her in a decrepit abandoned house next door, hidden in one of its musty closets. She was famished, her anorexia a ghost of the past. The seventh year dawned without relief until one haunting night. The clock ominously marked 1.40 a.m. when another shrill scream erupted from Haley's room. My heart pounded against my ribcage as I raced to her aid. A chilling sight awaited me. A man stood by her bed, a gleaming knife in hand. Before I could react, he lunged at her, his blade mercilessly carving into my precious girl. The gruesome sight seared into my memory, a waking nightmare that refused to fade. The man vanished, leaving a pool of blood and the remains of my precious child behind. The eighth year was a hollow shell of my life. Samantha left, taking Gregory, who barely recognized me now. Every day was an exercise in self-loathing. My late wife, mother to Haley, the cause of this curse, her hatred for me etched into every sin visited upon us, had her revenge. The voice that follows mine belongs to Gregory, the child from my story, now a grown man of 36. He received this recording from the police about a year ago, a suicide tape that I, his father, recorded back in 1980. When he was five, his mother received the news about my demise, responding with an hour of mournful tears. It was a full decade before she revealed the real story to him, her crocodile tears from earlier replaced with the bitter truth. She loathed me. In this twisted tale, I was the villain, driven by insanity. My life, marked by the hour of 1.40 a.m., the death hour of my first wife and our wedding anniversary. The psychologist I consulted post her death suspected that I was to blame for her demise. I used the seven deadly sins as an elaborate facade for my vengeance. I injected Haley with a shot of steroids on the night of my first wife's anniversary, triggering her heart condition. I orchestrated the demise of every woman who flirted with me over a year, crafting their deaths to mimic suicides. I force-fed Haley, stuffing her full of food, only to induce vomiting post every meal when she survived the ordeal. The third year saw me selling our house while letting Samantha freely use my credit card. I turned abusive, channeling my rage onto Samantha and Haley. The fourth year was marked by a delusional self-image of a gifted singer. I relentlessly pursued talent agencies, resorting to vulgarities when rejected. I even attempted murder, shooting at a man outside a studio, only managing to clip his ear. In the fifth year, my rage escalated, driving me to try and kill Samantha and Haley. Samantha fought back, pushing me down the stairs which resulted in short-term memory loss. In the sixth year, I drove Haley away from home, hurling abuse at her. When the forensics team returned her home, Samantha frequently referred to it as hell. In the seventh year, I became unnaturally calm, fooling everyone into believing I had changed. But at 1.40 a.m., on the anniversary of my first wife's death, I murdered Haley with a kitchen knife and disappeared with her remains. The beginning of the eighth year witnessed my suicide. The police ruled it as such, pointing to a makeshift noose crafted from organic materials. A heinous lie as the rope was Haley.